Hi all, my name is Lior, I'm the shop manager here at Makehaven, and this video is going to be an introduction to woodworking. We have a separate video on an intro to the wood shop. It's the video that's required to get the badge for the wood shop, and that covers a lot of the particulars about using this shop. What I'm hoping to cover in this video is how to even approach woodworking. It can be really intimidating, and frankly, it is fairly dangerous. So it's important to have a good sense of what wood even is and how to work with it, and all the, the little details that aren't really covered under any specific tool badging video. And so hopefully you'll finish this video feeling a little more confident that you know how to get started in the wood shop and excited to take on some woodworking projects. First, we're gonna talk about safety. Safety is obviously super important and it's, it's especially important because it's really hard to enjoy woodworking down the road if you're missing fingers because you didn't take safety seriously enough. Eyeglasses are required. A lot of modern woodworking tools have blades that spin really fast they can throw wood chips as well as pieces of metal. The teeth can break off of the saw blades and shoot like bullets. That wasn't a problem a long time ago with traditional hand woodworking tools, but now that is a real risk. So eyeglasses are required in the wood shop and metal shop. It's, it's just a good habit to get into. In terms of hearing protection, you can use earplugs or you can use these ear protectors. They're obviously valuable for protecting your hearing. There are plenty of older woodworkers who you can have a conversation with and, and they won't have heard you because their hearing is so shot from not wearing hearing protection. So it's important to use these whenever it feels reasonable. They do obviously diminish your hearing a little bit, so it makes it a little easier to be startled. So be aware of people around you so you aren't startled if someone walks past you when you're using a tool because you can't hear them quite as well. Uh, but in general, it's a good idea to use them when it feels appropriate. We don't have a hard rule about it. In terms of gloves, uh, gloves are great for using for carrying wood. Uh, if you're carrying heavy sheets or they're splintering, and you don't wanna hurt your hands, then that's great. Gloves are not good for using with tools. If you're using the bandsaw, for example, and for some reason your finger touched the blade, you could get away with just a nick. But if you're wearing gloves, then your whole hand could get pulled in and then you have a, you have a real mess on your hands. So that's why we don't use gloves when we're using the the tools themselves just for carrying material. And last we'll talk on hair ties, but also just trying to control things that are dangling at large, be that hair, necklaces. I won't be using a power tool wearing this. Uh, and if you see someone with, you know, with sleeves that are dangling down, just you know, throw them a quick reminder to roll their sleeves up. It just takes a second. They probably just didn't think about it and it'll make everyone a little more comfortable in the wood shop. Cleanliness is really important in terms of safety. It's hard to use tools safely when you're tripping over things and you're slipping on sawdust. So it is really important to clean up after yourself, between each tool perhaps. And sometimes that means cleaning up after others and that's just a bullet you have to bite. And realistically, people have cleaned up after you before. So don't take it too personally uh, and make sure to just be an example to others and be a part of this community by, by cleaning up really well after yourself and, and the shop at large. You always make a little more dust than you think you do. So just go a little bit wider and clean up a little bit more and that'll help make the experience safer for you and also in terms of breathing, so you're breathing in less dust. Last, in terms of safety, it is really important to be confident when you're using the tools. That's not brazenly overconfident. You don't wanna be doing things recklessly, but you wanna make sure that you feel confident. And if you're really timidly holding a piece of wood versus a powerful chop saw, then you know, it could just rip it right out of your hands and then you're in bad shape. So you really need to be holding onto the wood firmly. Uh, when you approach a tool, you wanna make sure you go through the badging process and practice as much as you want and make sure to ask as many questions as you have so that when you're using the tool, you, you really are holding firmly, you're standing firmly, you feel comfortable using the tool and, and confident so that you aren't overpowered by accident by the tool because you weren't holding onto something well enough. Along a similar vein, it's important to remember that when you're using a power tool, the tool should be doing the work. So you don't want to have to be pushing really hard when you're using a power tool. That probably means that something isn't going how it should be. There's, there's some, something about the setup is wrong and you want to reassess the situation. 
because in general, it shouldn't be that hard. And when you're pushing really hard on a power tool, chances are something's gonna bind up and blow up on you. And that also applies to hand tools. If you find yourself really struggling, there's probably something about your technique that can be modified to make it a lot easier for you. All right, so now we're gonna talk about wood at large. And wood obviously comes from trees. They're all different kinds of trees. They make all different kinds of woods. In general, when you go to buy wood, it's gonna fall into one of two categories. And those are deciduous and coniferous. So deciduous are hardwoods. They're trees that lose their leaves in the winter. Uh, things like oak, maple, walnut. And those trees take a long time to grow and they make a very heavy, hard, dense wood. Versus coniferous, which are things like pine and spruce. Those are evergreens that have needles. And they make a soft wood. They grow much more quickly. And their wood is much easier to work with. Uh, by virtue of its being softer and it also means that it's less durable so if you make something out of softwood it'll be easier to work with which is great but it also means that it might not last as long so that's just a balance you need to bear in mind it's cheaper because it grows more quickly uh, they're also exotic woods so in my mind it's important to make sure that the wood you're using or buying has been sourced responsibly it's not cutting down old rainforests to to get that piece of wood that you're going for. So just do a little research if that's important to you. Another thing worth mentioning is that a common misconception is that wood by its own virtue is environmentally irresponsible to use. Uh, I would actually argue the opposite in a lot of cases, that wood is a carbon sink, meaning that when a tree grows, it takes the CO2 from the air and locks it into its own molecules to make that, to make that wood. And as long as you don't burn that wood, it's kept in that the carbon is kept in that wood. And so it's actually helping to bind carbon versus if you are trying to get plastic, you need to mine oil from the ground and refine it and, and a lot of processes that are very bad for the environment. So as long as you're getting wood that has been responsibly sourced, meaning it was done in a sustainable way where trees are being planted, it's not cutting down old forests that are never gonna be the same way again and destroy habitats, then it's a pretty uh, environmentally responsible material to work with. So when the tree is first cut down, when it's harvested, they are left with a big log and it's green wood. And that means it's still very wet, it's very fresh wood. And so what you wanna do is you want to mill the wood. So the wood goes to a sawmill where they cut it up somehow. So if you go to a local sawmill, it's often cut up just in big planks. So we can look at this diagram, which will show that's live sawn, where you just cut back and forth to make these big planks. Um, there's also plain sawn on the left, which has boards that are pulled out of it in such a way that the grain is a little more consistent uh, for each board. And that's nice if you want a little more consistency in, in the grain pattern in your piece of wood. Um, however, it's not quite so good as something like quarter sawn, which is a traditionally respected type of sawing pattern because all the grain is really consistent and it's perpendicular to the face of the wood that you're working with. There's also rifts on as, as well as others. And that's just something to bear in mind. You can often look at the end of a piece of wood and determine where in the tree it came from. So if you look at this piece of wood, you can look at the end of it and see that the middle of the tree was probably somewhere right over here. And that can be informative. It'll also affect how the wood will change with humidity and temperature. And that's something that's important to bear in mind that wood is very organic, it's very dynamic, it's very different than steel, for example. You have a chunk of steel, it has isotropic properties, meaning it's the same in every direction. You pull on it one way, it's as strong as pulling on it the other way, drilling it, cutting it. Uh, wood is anisotropic, meaning you know, if, you, if you have this piece of wood, it behaves very differently depending on which way you push and pull on it. Uh, and that's very important for thinking about how you use the wood. Similarly, the wood is like a whole bunch of straws. So if you can imagine this in tree form, the water is being conducted up and down the tree. And so the water comes out of the ends by and large instead of out of the faces. So if you have your, our, our tree that's just been cut down and it's this big log, they'll often paint the ends like this with some colored paint and that helps to retain some of the moisture so that it doesn't all just evaporate because that can result in the wood cracking. So once they have uh, milled this wood, 
into whatever pattern they wanted to mill it, the wood needs to be dried. And so wood can be dried naturally, where it's just left out uh, with sticks in between each board to help the air flow through it. And after a few years, the humidity will reduce enough so that you can use it. The reason you need to dry the wood is because in the process of drying, the wood twists and warps and does all kinds of changes to its shape. And so if you went and built a piece of furniture out of it, a year later, it would be a totally bent up piece of furniture. So you need to let it dry first, and then you can work with it once you know it's in its relatively final shape. It'll still move around a little bit, but a lot less than it would in its original state. There are some times when you do want to use green wood because it's a lot easier for turning, for example. So a lot of professional wood turners, meaning using a lathe, a spinning, a tool that spins the piece of wood, it is easier to do some of the turning when the wood is still green. Or steam bending, for example, is much easier done with green wood. But by and large, you want to work with kiln dried or naturally dried wood, wood that's been dried one way or the other. And that's mostly what you're going to find at a lumber yard when you go to buy the wood. So at this point, after our wood has been dried, it's still rough. So that means literally rough. So we have this piece of wood here, and the surface of it is still rough from the saw blade when the tree was milled originally. And this side is also rough. But this face and this edge are dressed. And dressed means that they have, they're smoother, you can just visually see it, but we also know that they're 90 degrees to each other. So this is flat, and this is flat, and those two flat faces are perpendicular to each other. These we can't say, anything. I can say it's not flat just by feeling it, and these might not be 90 degrees to each other. The goal of dressing all four sides is to get to what's called S4S, square on four sides, and that's where you have all four sides that are flat and perpendicular or parallel to each other. So that's the, that's the goal of dressing the wood. And to do that, you use the jointer and planer, which we'll look at in a little bit. So often if you buy wood at a lumber yard, it won't be dressed, it'll still be rough. So you won't be able to really see what the wood is that you're getting. It's only once you dress it that you can see how beautiful it is. Here, it's a little hard to see what you're getting. Uh, and, but what you can see is how much warping has taken place. So when you have this piece of wood and it dried in the kiln or naturally, uh, what can happen is a whole bunch of kinds of warping. So the, the three kinds that can happen are a bow. So that would be where the wood does this kind of shape and it'll rock back and forth on that side and sit on this side. The other is a twist. The whole piece of wood is twisted. So if you put a twisted piece of wood on the table, it'll rock corner to corner. And the last is cupping. So cupping is when along the profile or the cross section of this piece of wood, it has, a, has this shape to it. And so all those can happen. And when you dress a piece of wood, the goal is to remove all of those. So you're just left with an S4S piece of wood. In the process of dressing a piece of wood, you're going to lose a bunch of the wood. And so that is where some of the confusion around 2x4s comes from. 2x4s uh, sound like they should be 2 inches by 4 inches in cross section. But if you go to Home Depot to buy a 2x4, you'll find that it's more like 1.5 by 3.5. And, and the reason for that is originally it was a 2x4, but then when they dressed the wood, they lost a bunch of wood on all the sides, and now it's closer to 1.5 by 3.5, but they still call it a 2x4. So that can be confusing. So make sure to, to actually measure the wood so that you know what dimensions it is. So now we're going to look at some of the types of wood that I've pulled out here, just to get a sense of some of the options available. This is a wood called Purple Heart, so it is quite purple. Uh, it's a beautiful wood. Um, all these woods have some of their own properties that are special to it. In general, though, I would say that once you're working with either a hardwood or a softwood, the differences are primarily aesthetic. There are some differences in terms of pores, pore sizes, and, and stuff like that. Uh, but really, when I'm choosing the wood, it's, it's mostly about price and aesthetics. So Purple Heart is obviously more expensive, but it's beautiful, so it's great for inlays and, and for doing some detail work. This piece here looks to me like cherry, so it has a really lovely color and grain. Here you can see what's called chatoyance, which is sort of that, that pearly effect in the wood, that sort of rippling look. Uh, here, this might be sepele, which is an African mahogany. This also has some really lovely color to it. It's a little lighter, less, less dense than this cherry. Here we have walnut. This is an incredible looking piece of wood that I haven't been able to find a, a purpose 
worthy of uh, yet. So on this side, this looks like more traditional walnut. And then over on this side, it has really incredible, almost like scaling, um, just really cool figuring in the wood. So this is something that traditionally like wouldn't have been valued all that much because woodworking, traditional woodworking valued really clean, consistent grain. But in modern woodworking, where machines have by and large taken over and can make a lot of the things that traditional woodworkers can make, we now tend to value things that have a lot of natural character and beauty to them that can't be replicated by a machine. This is red oak. So here you can see oak's characteristic large pore pattern, potentially if you see really closely. Uh, it also has sort of a double grain pattern going on. These are all hardwoods. So oak, walnut, cherry, sapelli, these are all trees that take a long time to grow and make a really hard, dense wood. So this is an example of a piece of pine is a softwood and you can see along this edge that it looks like it was it was just cracked maybe broken right along that line instead of cut uh, it was just following the grain where it, where it broke and you can also see that it, you know here it was just it was just crushed from from being so soft I can probably even take my fingernail and leave a mark in it I don't know if you can see that but you can just sort of dig in your finger so while this wood is great for a lot of things and this is what is used to build houses because it is very strong as a structural element, it isn't very resistant to wear. So, um, you know, pluses and minuses to each kind of wood. This is an interesting wood. So this is probably pine, or spruce maybe, and it's pressure treated. So you can see by its green tint that it's been impregnated with chemicals that prevent it, or certainly mitigate rotting. So normal wood, if it sits in water outside for a long time, and the wood isn't allowed to dry off when it's not raining, will eventually rot. But pressure treated wood is great for some things for outdoor construction because it will just not rot for a long time. Uh, it does look a little weird, but you can paint it and then it doesn't have that green color to it. Here are three wood products, they're called. Uh, so this one is plywood. This is sort of a low grade plywood. It's called plywood because it's made up of plies of wood. Here it looks like there's three of them sandwiched around each other. And what's cool about these is the grains run in different orientations. So what that means is the grain of the wood is those straws that travel through it, through up through the piece of wood. And the grain is sort of the demarcation between those layers, between the straws. And what can happen is in between the grains, it's not very strong. So in this dimension, it's quite strong, pulling, pushing, twisting. But if you look at a piece of wood more like this, then if you, were, you could probably karate chop this down the middle because the strength in between the, the grains is not very strong. So you can't, it's hard to make big sheets of wood that are strong because they'd be very weak. Also, we don't really have trees that big anymore. So we have plywood where they take sheets of wood that are made with a razor blade, sort of cutting a tree into thin layers, and then they're glued with the grains in alternating directions. And when they're stacked up, it makes them quite strong. This is another plywood, it's just much nicer, a much nicer quality. This has a bunch more plies to it, so it's probably more stable. And you can see on the outer edges, there's a veneer, meaning a thin layer of wood that's of high quality, so it's really pretty. And then in the core, there are a bunch of plies that are lower quality wood. And here we have something called OSB, oriented strand board. This is made from wood chips that are just kind of glued and pressed together. So this is mostly used in construction where you're not going to see the final product, but it can be useful. It's quite cheap. This is MDF for medium density fiber board, sort of like cardboard. So it really can't get wet. It just disintegrates with water. But for some indoor purposes, it can be, it can be good. Uh, and then this is sort of like an Ikea product where they have like a plastic veneer on here that looks like wood and then some sort of wood chip composite in the middle. So it would be really a stretch. I mean, neither of these are really wood, but they sort of act similarly in some ways. So that's sort of a quick overview at some of these woods here. There are a lot of other kinds, uh, but again, I wouldn't stress too much about the properties of the woods when you're buying it. I would think mostly about the price and the appearance of that piece of wood. And maybe you know, seeing if it has a big crack down the middle, that's gonna be a pain to work with. Or if it's really twisted, you're gonna lose a lot of wood when you're working with it. Often if you're buying wood at a place like Home Depot, 
then it'll already be dressed, so you don't have to worry about what's underneath it. It'll just be much, much more expensive, which is why if you're buying any amount of wood, I would recommend going to a lumber yard. And on Make Even web website, we have listed a whole bunch of local places to buy wood. We also sell some here at Make Haven to help make that process a little easier. On the topic of buying wood, we'll talk briefly about what that's like so you feel confident when you're going into a lumber yard. Um, so the two important things to know are one, the wood is sorted by type and then by thickness, and the thickness is measured in quarters. So I don't know why, but for some reason they don't just describe wood uh, as we normally do, saying like this is one and a half inches, they would say it's six quarters, uh, or eight quarters, or four quarters, and, and that's mostly confusing, but just now you know that that's how they measure it, the thickness. Then normally the length will be written on the end of the piece of wood, because it'll be stacked with a whole bunch of others, so it's hard to see how long it is without pulling it out, which can be a pain. And then it's measured by the board feet. So board feet is actually a unit of volume, meaning it's not a linear foot. A board foot is 12 inches by 12 inches by one inch thick. That's one board foot. And they'll say it's like $5 per board foot. But this piece of wood isn't 12 inches wide by, you know, it, that metric doesn't work for this. If we say it's three inches wide by an inch and a half thick, then it'll actually be like two feet long or something. Would account for the volume of one board foot. So between those two pieces of information, you should be able to go to any lumber yard and, and feel confident picking out a piece of wood. In general, they're pretty nice, so if you have questions, just feel free to ask uh, and tell them you know, what you're trying to make maybe, and, and they should be able to give you some pointers. So now we can look at a piece of wood and talk about some of the lexicon around the cutting operations that are done on those pieces. And that's important, so everyone's using the same language. And then in a, in a little bit, when we do the tour of all the tools in the shop, then you can figure out and, and sort of get a sense of which tools are used for which cutting operations. Cutting it this way would be ripping it. So that's cutting with the grain on the wide face of it. Cutting across the grain is cross cutting. And then cutting with the grain in this direction is called resawing. So when it was at the sawmill, it got sawed into these planks, so resawing would be cutting it again to make it thinner in that dimension. So those are some basic words that we use. And obviously, you know, if you cut it 45 degrees, then it's somewhere between ripping and cross-cutting. If you imagine it is actually very different for the, from the tool's perspective and from yours when you're cutting with a bunch of straws versus across them. And that's especially apparent if you're using hand tools where you can really feel how much more work you need to do to cut through all those straws versus just cutting with them. So now that we've looked at the very basics of wood, we're gonna do a little walk around the wood shop to get a sense of what the tools are for and how you use them to work with the wood that you have. When you're using the woodworking benches, which are also tools, please be conscious of being kind to the tables. They took a lot of work to make, and so we wanna to try to not hurt them. So that means not scuffing them up and cutting into them and getting glue on them. And when you do, try to, you know, put some water on the glue just to wipe it away uh, and that will help the tables be useful for many years to come. So here we'll look at some of the hand drills. There are more old-fashioned hand drills as well as the more modern ones. Uh, these can be used for making holes in the wood as well as putting fasteners in. Something else to notice here is that a lot of tools will have a label but they don't have a badge. So you're more than welcome to go to the website or scan the QR code to watch the videos and to learn more about how to use the tools and what they're used for. If you do have more questions, by all means, feel free to ask the facilitators to help you learn how to use the tools well and safely. Don't feel that the facilitators are there just to get you badged on badge equipment. They're there to facilitate. So if you have any questions about how to use anything or how to approach any project, feel free to ask the facilitators about that. In general, this kind of drill is used for making the holes, and this one, the impact driver, is, for use, is used for driving the fasteners into the wood. There are a lot of different types of woodworking, uh, but in general, when you're putting pieces of wood together, you want to be using the joints and the glue to hold the wood together, and then screws or nails just to help hold it together while it's drying up. Here we have some tools that go on the woodworking bench, and then these are pneumatic nail guns. So pneumatic means that they use compressed air, which you can see 
those red hoses carry from the compressor in the back, and that compressor goes into the tool and then is used to punch the nail into the wood. So pneumatic is just an alternative to electric, which has some benefits and drawbacks. So this is definitely a good, good set of tools to get badged on. Here are a bunch of tape measures. Tape measures seem fairly straightforward, but there are actually a few tricks to them. So when you have this tape measure, it has this little hook at the end, and that hook goes and snags on to the end of your piece of work, or it can push up against the inside of it. And you might notice that this piece actually has a little bit of wobble to it. And that's important because when you're pushing up on the underside of something, you want it to slide down a little bit to account for the thickness of that piece of metal, versus when you're pulling on the top, you want it to be able to slide it away a little bit for that same reason, just so that you aren't accidentally measuring from the wrong place. In general, we use fractional measurements, which is why most of the tapes have inches on them. And inches are measured in full inches, and then halves, and quarters, and eighths, and sixteenths, and thirty seconds. So it may not be the system you choose to use, but a lot of the tools use that measuring technique, so it's important to know how to read it. Uh, so in this case, you just look straight at the tape, and there's a little chamfer on the corner there, so it's a little trickier to read, but just to the top edge of the chamfer looks to me like two and three thirty seconds, maybe. And obviously, depending on how precise you want to be, determines how you, how you measure things. So here are some other measuring tools. These measure angle. This is a distance meter. This tool measures humidity. So if you have a piece of wood and you're not sure how dry it is, you can use this tool. Then here's a profile gauge. So the profile gauge pushes these pins up against a profile. And then you can scribe that profile onto another thing, piece of wood, paper, so you can capture the edge shape of it. Here we have a height gauge, some calipers for really fine measurements, a bevel square for capturing angles. This is a combination square, so you can measure a bunch of things with this. A tri-square is just really for making 90 degree measurements and, and marks. This is a metal detector, so it's important not to hit metal in your wood when you're cutting it. You just squeeze the trigger, and then when it gets close to metal, it beeps. And there are all kinds of other, other goodies around here. There's a speed square, which is just convenient for marking a right angle. We're just going to do a little example of some layout here on this piece of wood. And uh, we're going to say that we want a piece of wood nine inches long. So I'm just going to take this tape measure and use this lock to pull it out and lock it down. And put this against the bottom edge, come up, and I'm going to mark right above nine inches. So a Sharpie is not a great tool for this because it has a fat line, but as long as you're intentional about where you put that line, it's okay. So I'm putting it right above nine inches. And then we're gonna take this speed square and line it up and put this right underneath that mark so that the Sharpie is continuing along that same line. And there we go. So we have now nine inches on this side of the mark, under, under the mark. And something else you can do with a speed square, which is kind of cool and not super accurate, but good enough for a lot of purposes, is if you pivot around this point, around this corner, you just line up with an angle here. So say you wanted 20 degrees around that point. We now have 20, a 20 degree angle. So that's pretty useful. Then if you're going to cut this piece of wood, you need to bear in mind that the line is on the outside of the piece of material you want to keep. So the blade has kerf to it. The blade has width. And that's the wood that's going to be turned into sawdust. Uh, you're not cutting it with a razor blade. So that saw blade needs to go somewhere. And you want to remove the material, in, in this case, including the Sharpie blade, leaving just that, you know, the nine inches south of this line. And other times you may put the line on the material, and then you're cutting above the line. It doesn't really matter as long as you are intentional about where you put it so you know that you're putting the kerf on the right side. That also means that if you have a piece of wood, say, two feet long, you're not going to get four or six inch pieces of wood out of it because the curve of the wood is going to take some away each time. So you need to make sure to take that into account when you're doing your layout, when you're laying out where your pieces are going to go in your pieces of wood. And here we have the hand tools. So hand tools are often seen as the logical beginning point for woodworking. And that idea definitely has some merit. But 
using hand tools is very difficult. There's a reason that we started using power tools, that those were invented, and they really make it a lot easier. So when you make something with hand tools, it's very rewarding. You truly own that piece after you're done making it. You have a lot of sweat in that, in that piece after you're done, uh, but it is much more involved. So um, a beginning woodworking course often uses power tools because say to make a cutting board with power tools can take two hours. Doing all that with hand tools would take days, potentially. So uh, it's just Im important to, to have due respect for the hand tools. These happen to be the really fancy ones that you need to know how to use carefully. There are some others on the wall that are just available for use without a badge, but these can really be rewarding and satisfying to use once you take the time to learn how to use them. And over here, we have a whole bunch of saws. So these are traditional American saws, which means they cut while they're pushing. So you can see that my finger is grabbing in this direction, but slides easily in this direction. So that means it's cutting only in the, in the pushing direction uh, versus a Japanese saw. And let's see, so here's an example of a saw with a Japanese style blade that cuts while it's pulling. So I can slide my finger down easily, but I can't slide it up. So that's just sort of a stylistic difference and preference that you may have. Uh, this is a coping saw, so this can do really fine cuts as well as you can take the blade out and put it through a hole if you wanna make uh, cuts within a piece of wood. All different kinds of hammers and mallets, all different kinds of pliers and wrenches and other things that can be useful. These are chisels, so just a straight knife edge that can be great for cutting wood. You'll find quickly that cutting with the grain is much easier than cutting across the grain. And here are just some uh, shop aprons you can use to help keep the sawdust off if you so choose. Glue is one of the many ways for putting things together in woodworking. So you wanna put enough glue between your two pieces of wood so that some squeezes out around the edges when you use clamps to hold them together. A whole bunch of different kinds of glues here, but Type Bond 3 is the one that we supply so we we make sure that that's stocked and though if you're using a huge amount it probably makes sense to get your own type on three is waterproof so it's good for indoors and outdoors so it's a pretty versatile glue so in general that's a good one to go with though if you have more specific needs feel free to ask or research about other types of glues that you might want to use the clamps are live right over here and we'll just talk about them quickly as long as we're here uh, and so Many of these are squeeze clamps where you just squeeze the handle and it brings them together and you pinch here and it releases it. There are a number of other kinds as well. And then here are fasteners, which can also help to put your materials together. Screws have pointy tips and threads around the outside versus nails also have a pointy tip, but no threads. You hit them in with a hammer and then nuts and bolts don't have pointy tips, but they have threads that screw into nuts. So the nuts go around the bolts. And there are a whole bunch of other options there. Here's a nice summary of different types of screws and nails and bolts and stuff like that that can be nice to learn about. Back over here, we have, these are a whole bunch of routers. So routers are just a motor that spins a router bit. So they're all different kinds of shapes you can make. So here you can see that when you spin this kind of bit, it makes this kind of shape in a piece of wood. So that can be useful for making designs around it or putting pieces of wood together in different ways. Over here, we have a circular saw. This is mostly used in construction. It's not used so much in a wood shop. Uh, similar with a sawzall and this rotary hammer drill. These are tools that are mostly used in construction, but occasionally might be useful. And over here, we have all different kinds of drill bits. So drill bits just cut straight holes. They don't cut sideways. Um, here we have some bigger ones, some an index, meaning a whole collection of sizes, some specialty ones. These go in the drill or the drill press to make holes. And these are hole saws to make bigger holes as well as some steam bending tools. So if you take green wood and steam it for a while, it gets flexible enough to bend. This, these both are band saws and these are called band saws because the blade inside is literally one big band. So you can see that the, the band goes all the way around and it's just one, one big loop. 
This bandsaw is for resawing. So I remember, remember that means taking your piece of wood and cutting it this way. That's why it can get so high to accommodate a really tall piece of wood. And this one is for doing curvy cuts. So you would take your piece of wood and move it through like that to make curvy cuts and pieces of wood. This is the jointer. So the jointer is the first tool that you use when you're dressing wood. So let's say we had our piece of wood and we had no idea what kind of craziness was going on. You pass it over and pass it over and it makes one flat face. So then you know that this face is just flat, which, is, which can be nice when you have a totally twisted piece of wood. Then you put that flat face against this back fence, pass it over, and then my thumb, metaphorically, becomes also flat and perpendicular to my palm. So now the jointer has given us one flat face and one flat edge. And then we can go over to the planer where we can put our piece of wood in. And it makes the top of my hand parallel to the bottom of my hand and smooth. So now we have three flat faces, two flat faces and a flat edge. And then we go over to the table saw and the table saw is for ripping, which you might recall is cutting the, uh, along the grain of the piece of wood. So we have this piece and we'd flip it over. So now every side except the left side of my hand here has been flattened and we run my thumb along the fence. So this fence is referencing against my thumb. And so we know that it's now totally straight and running smooth. And this is the last step in making S4S wood. So we pass it through and now my pinky is totally cut off and smooth and flat and perpendicular to the other two sides and parallel to my thumb. So that is how we get a piece of wood that's totally straight, which is really nice. We can then come over to the chop saw and again, entirely metaphorically, take our piece of wood and cut across the grain. So when we cut across, a that's uh, called cross cutting. And that's how we in general cut our piece of wood to length. And between those tools, those are sort of the primary woodworking tools, power tools that you can use to do a lot of woodworking. So tools were really invented as ways to solve the most basic challenges that we had in woodworking. So we decided that taking a motor and putting in a table with a blade spinning like this was useful. Being able to tilt it, which this can do, is also useful. By turning a knob down here, the blade can tilt. So that can be pretty neat. Uh, and, but that also means that these power tools don't solve all of our problems. They just get, they do a good job at solving a lot of them. And that's why we make jigs. So oftentimes you'll find, you'll spend half your time just making a jig. Here's some examples that people have made that will help facilitate using that tool in such a way that it meets exactly your need for that piece of woodworking. Now we can hop around and just look at some of the other tools that are here that are more auxiliary tools. These are both CNC machines. So these are routers, similar to what we looked at before, but they're controlled by a computer. And so they zip around and can cut out shapes that you've made on a computer. So here are some examples. So this is, these are fairly magical tools in what they can, what they can do for you. They're sort of the opposite of hand woodworking tools on the spectrum of how traditional they are. Uh, you do very little actual physical work. You do a lot of work on the computer getting that piece. And then once you're done, you just click go and it zips and, and cuts things out for you. So those, those CNCs are very convenient in that way and can do very precise work. Over here, this is a Tormek sharpener. So this is for sharpening chisels and plane blades and kitchen knives. And then we have a, the scroll saw. So the scroll saw is a really fine little blade. And this is a great tool for getting started in the wood shop because it's not very intimidating and it can do really beautiful work. So definitely check out the project binder or on the website, the project page to check out some projects that you can do using a scroll saw. And over here are the sheets that facilitators use when they're badging members. So on them, they list out all the steps that you should be thinking about and safety steps that you need to do when you're using a tool. And you can also refer to them anytime. So if at some point you haven't used the lathe in a while, for example, you're welcome to refer to it just to get a reminder for all the things that you need to check and safety things you need to take into consideration. Also in this container in the back is a book from the uh, Woodworking Career Alliance. And what this allows you to do 
is get an accredited certification in woodworking. So if you're interested in pursuing woodworking professionally, you can talk to any of the staff here and we have assessors who can help guide you through the process of getting these certifications. But you're welcome to flip through this book because this shows you what the tests will be like for getting the certifications in various tools and projects in woodworking. And this is a panel saw. So if you imagine you had a big flat piece of wood, like a big piece of plywood, you could slide it into the panel saw and easily cut it. It's a lot easier just to move that saw than it is to slide that huge piece of plywood over the table saw. Here's a lathe. So the lathe is, in my mind, the, the most enjoyable woodworking tool to use, most enjoyable power woodworking tool to use. Uh, it's similar to, to sculpting with clay or something on a, on a pottery wheel because you're not just pushing a piece of wood through a blade to complete an operation. You're actually using a carving tool to carve that wood into something beautiful. And so that can be really pleasant even if you're doing it just for its own sake. No one goes to the table saw and cuts things up just for the pleasure of it, but people regularly use the lathe just because it's a delightful tool. Here's a drill press. So the drill press holds drill bits and can cut things very straight and precisely and powerfully. Here's the router table. So underneath is a router motor. You may have gathered that a router is a pretty important tool in the woodworking shop. It's really, you know, all tools are just motors somehow connected to a blade that spins. And so in this case, people thought it was useful to put a router underneath a table and here you can pass your wood over it. So let's say I was making a cutting board with this piece of wood and I wanted to curve the edges, put a little round over on them. Then I could pass it over and this bit, and this bit, when we pass it over, would cut a little round over with that curved edge on, our, on the corner of our piece of wood to make that cutting board. This is one of many sanders. So a sander uses sandpaper, which is paper that has been impregnated with some sand or some sort of hard material that cuts away at your wood. And so that can be good for softening hard corners. When you cut it with a saw, it can often be rough or have sharp corners, and this softens those. There are different grits. The lower the grit number, the rougher the finish it'll leave. So it has really big grits of sand, and that's good for removing a lot of material. The higher the number, and it goes up to crazy high numbers if you're like polishing a car, for example, the smoother the finish it leaves. It's really important to make sure that you start and you, with a low number and you finish, you get everything, all your big scratches away until it's as smooth as possible before moving on. Because if I went from 80 grit to 200 grit, it would take me hours and hours and hours to sand away all the problems with that 200 grit that I hadn't gotten with the 80 grit or with the, all the intervening numbers. Here's some other types of hand sanders that we have. So once you've made the thing that you're trying to make, say you start with a simple project, you need to finish it. And finishing refers to a treatment that you do to the wood so that it lasts longer or so that it's prettier or something like that. There are tons of different kinds of finishes all with their own benefits. So in terms of the types of finishes available, it can get pretty confusing because there are a whole lot. So I'll try to give a brief summary of the finishes that are available. Uh, they're the most simple ones like mineral oil, which is an oil that gets absorbed into the wood. It doesn't dry ever. You should keep reapplying it periodically. And it offers some water resistance so that beets and whatever stains up don't get into a cutting board, for example. It's food safe. So you can put it on a cutting board, things that you'll eat off of. And it also makes the wood beautiful. It, it lights it up, it, it shows the grain more, so it, it's, a, it's a great finish, though it's not very protective in terms of abrasion, for example. Then a step more durable from something like mineral oil is an oil that dries. So boiled linseed oil or tongue oil are examples of oils that will dry after some time, and those Again, offer, they darken the color, they make it more rich, they expose the grain, but they don't offer very much protection. If they form any film at all on the surface, it's a very, very thin one. It's mostly absorbed into the wood. Those are great to make things beautiful, but they don't offer very much protection. And they're not shiny. They normally offer a sort of natural looking finish. Then there are varnishes. And varnishes include something like polyurethane, which forms a plastic coating on top. So it goes into the wood a little bit and hopefully has a good bite, but it, it makes a, a layer of, of plastic that's very protective. So on a floor, if you're walking on it, on things where you really want it to be really durable, 
use something like spirourethane or polyurethane. Those are varnishes that, that polymerize, which means it turns into a plastic. And so those are really great for making something very durable. It can be very shiny as well. So if you want a high gloss finish, uh, it can do that. It can, however, look kind of fake and plastic. It doesn't look very natural necessarily. Then there are evaporative finishes. And so those are things like lacquer or shellac. So that's when you have a resin dissolved in a solvent and it doesn't polymerize, the solvent just comes off, just, just evaporates. So shellac is actually the shell of a beetle that they grind up and you mix into alcohol and it makes a finish that you can put on your, on your piece of wood and it can be really shiny and beautiful and offer some, some protection. Maybe not quite as good as polyurethane, but it is a little more natural and can offer some different colors and is more traditional. And then, just to confuse the matter, there are combinations of mixtures of everything. And if you go to the store and look, you won't really be able to tell what's what much of the time because they give everything all kinds of different confusing names that don't really mean a whole lot. So realistically, in my mind, you need to decide how much protection you want. Do you want it to be a really hard, durable, protective coating? Do you want it to be a more natural look? Do you want to eat off of it? Uh, if you want to eat off it at all, then you probably want mineral oil or maybe beeswax. So I just made a rattle for a baby, so I used beeswax. That's an easy decision if you, if you want to be eating off of it for a bowl, for a cutting board, anything like that. If you want a really hard, durable surface, like on a cornhole game I made recently, then you use polyurethane or sparurethane, which is better for outdoors. And that will give it a really hard, waterproof plastic coating. If it's going on the wall, so it doesn't need to be that durable, but you do want it to be long lasting uh, and beautiful, then you can consider something like boiled linseed oil or shellac or lacquer. And a lot of those are just determined by how you want to put it on, if you want to spray it or wipe it or exactly what color you want. Speaking of colors, there's stains and stains offer no protection, they just color the wood. So there are often lots and lots of different colors of stains, you wipe those on, you can wipe more on for a darker color and often that's used to take something made out of pine, for example, and make it look like walnut, like some fancy wood. So it's a little out of style right now, but it still can be a great tool to use if you want to change the color of a piece of wood. And the last, there's paint. And so paint totally obscures the wood, covers it completely, uh, but it can be very protective and long lasting. So paint can also be a great solution. We have an approved finishes list on the website. If you go to the fume hood page, it's also there. The fume hood is a tool that we have for applying finishes in if they produce VOCs. VOCs are volatile organic compounds that are bad for people's health. So if you're using a finish that has that, uh, then you can use the fume hood if it's on the approved list and you can get it added to that list or outside. And there are a few other options you can learn about at the, uh, on the fume hood page or by asking any of the facilitators or staff. And then really a good message for, for all questions when it comes to woodworking, just to lower your level of inhibition and to feel more comfortable approaching the shop and, and starting on a project is to feel really comfortable asking questions of everyone. If you see someone, anyone, feel free to ask them a question. Uh, if you aren't sure how to do something, feel free to Google, post on Slack. So bear in mind that really the whole goal of Makehaven is to help facilitate beginners feel more confident and get to a point where they can explore and uh, develop their skills. We also help to facilitate professionals, but by and large professionals want their own shop. So we do help people get to the point where they feel professional enough to have their own shop in a big facility that where they're working at a production level. But we really feel here that, that we're helping people develop a comfort with woodworking and all the other areas. So please don't hesitate to ask questions. Start with a simple project. Uh, you can by starting with a simple project, get exposed to tool by tool until you gain a level of comfort. Alternatively, just start getting badged on things. You know, just start with the table saw and maybe the chop saw, the joint or the planer. Those are like the four core ones. And then branch out to the lathe. That's really fun. You could start with the scroll saw. That's really fun. And just, just by getting badged on the tool, you can help to build that confidence and the repertoire of tools so you have a wherewithal of, of how all these tools work together in the world of woodworking. And bearing in mind that the world of woodworking is infinitely deep, so everyone is just getting started in their own you know, ways. I feel fairly confident in a lot of things, but I've never done marquetry before, which is a particular type of woodworking. I've done a little steam bending. 
here's an example of what you can do with steam bending. This is taking an inch of oak and steaming it and then bending it at all kinds of angles. Uh, so that's a, a cool possibility. There's veneering where you take really thin layers of wood and work with them. There's all kinds of worlds that to, to be explored and to, to read about in our library and search and about online. Uh, so don't, don't feel like they're experts and novices. Everyone's you know, at, their own, at their own point and, and excited to learn and develop their skills. So I hope you enjoy your time here and work on all kinds of fun projects. You're excited to learn from others and share your own work. And I'm excited to see all the great things you make. Take care.